centric. Lord, we continue to minister the gospel, the need to be reconciled to God. I want to start by considering a passage in the book of Hebrews. It says, The Word of God, for the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. It's, it pierces joint and of marrow and discerns the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So we come out here as the church with the sword that God has given us, the sword which is the Word of God, to pierce hearts, to convict you of your sin by the power of the Holy Spirit, to call you to repentance, to plead with you, to turn to Jesus Christ, to have eternal life. The reality is that all of us have fallen short of the glory of God, and there is an utter need for you to repent and believe in Him. Rather than living a lifestyle chasing after euphoria, chasing after your lust, chasing after your sin, chasing after everything that you love, rather than doing that, you must look to Christ because He's the means by which you can be saved from this lifestyle and saved from His wrath. See, we do not deserve God. We do not deserve Jesus Christ. We do not deserve to be in His presence. We do not deserve communion with God. And yet God in His sheer mercy and love made a way through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is God. And He came on this earth as a man, representing us as a legal representative. See, Adam, he was the first man and he represented all of mankind. And when Adam was on this earth, he rebelled against the one commandment of God. God promised life if he would just not eat of the one tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he would not eat of that fruit, there would be life. And Adam failed. He failed in this way of prospering and having life, and he chose death over life. But Jesus Christ, the second Adam, came. It says that in Adam all die, but in Christ all may be made alive. You see, so Jesus Christ is our representative. He is the one that you must cling to. Jesus Christ came. He fulfilled all of the commandments of God perfectly. He loved the law, the Lord, or the law of the Lord. He loved His law, and He was obedient to that law. If you look at 1 John 2, it talks about this. It talks about how we must walk in the same ways as Jesus. It says, Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. The way in which Jesus walked was without sin. The book of Hebrews says that we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. So why is it so important that Jesus Christ is without sin? Well, He represents us. He represents those who have faith in Him. Through faith in Jesus, God the Father can look upon me as a child of God, even though all I've done in my life is live as an enemy of the cross. God's wrath should be upon me, but rather than having His wrath because I believe in Jesus Christ, because I've confessed with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, I'm seen as perfectly righteous, even though I haven't lived righteously. You see, Jesus says you must be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect. You must stand before God with no sin, but all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. What will you do with your sin? What will you do with your guilt? You must cling to Christ. See, all these women are in here serving themselves, serving their sin, wanting to kill their babies, killing their babies, saying, there's nothing wrong, truth is subjective, this is my way of living, you can't tell me what to do with my body. That's false, that's a lie, that's not true. All wisdom and knowledge are hidden in Jesus Christ, and the only way you can vindicate your knowledge or say that anything is true is through the truth, Jesus Christ. You must cling to Jesus. You must look to that rugged cross, that Roman cross where Jesus Christ bled and died for sins. See, Adam, he failed in a garden, but when Jesus was in the garden of Gethsemane, he prevailed in the garden. He endured temptation, and yet he was without sin. And he went and he died. Why did Jesus have to die? Because the wages of sin is death. And Ezekiel 18 says, the soul who sins shall die. Death entered the world because of Adam. Adam could have had life, but he ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And every time you sin, you're choosing death over life. The scriptures say, all who hate me love death. So when you're trying to blur out, you're trying to zone out the gospel, you're trying to snuff it out of your life, that reveals that you hate, you hate God and you love death. 
But we don't want you to love your death. We don't want you to love your sin. We want you to come to Christ because He can give you peace, joy, righteousness. If you look at 1 Corinthians 1.30, it talks about all the things that Christ is to us, to us believers. It says, and because of Him, this is a reality for Christians, because of Him you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. You see, Jesus Christ is my righteousness. I'm not here to boast in what I've done. I'm here to boast in the cross of Christ. Far be it for me to boast, except in the cross of my Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. You need to look to Christ and boast in Him. You must hear this and accept the free gift of grace, because there is a free gift of grace to all who would trust and believe on the Lord. It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. So what must you do to be saved? What must you do to flee from the just wrath of God? What must you do to flee from your death that you love? You must trust in Christ, receive that free gift of grace, repent and believe. Jesus Christ, he came preaching, repent and believe for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Many people, professing Christians, say they don't need repentance. Well, Jesus, the first words that he said in his earthly ministry was repent. You must repent. Repent or perish. That's what Jesus said. So if you don't repent, you'll perish. What is repentance? The Greek word is metanoia. It has to do with a changing of mind. You're going one way. You're living your life in sin. You're living however you want to live. You realize your sin. You realize your death. You realize that you've done nothing to serve God. And you turn away from this way of death. And you look to Jesus Christ. And you have eternal life. Will you have your death and your sin? Or will you have Jesus Christ and everlasting life? God is eternal. He's infinite. You're finite. You're not infinite, and you're going to spend however many years of life that God has given you rebelling against Him to go to hell? That's foolish. You can have eternal life and dwell with Him. Do you love your sins so much that you want death and you want hell? Is that what you want? Again, Jesus said repent or perish. Those are your only two options. You must look to Christ. Sir, I hear you jam into all these songs about smoking weed and all that stuff. I used to live that lifestyle. I, did, I smoked weed. I did ecstasy, cocaine, meth. You name it, I did all of that. I used to say that nothing could stop my lifestyle. Nothing can stop me in my sin. But God in His omnipotence and His power, He stopped me. He changed me. He took out the heart that hated Him. The heart that once hated His law. He pulled that heart out. He dropped that heart out and He gave me a heart that had His law written on it. So now I love His law. I love the things of God. I can exclaim with the psalmist, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. That can be you. You can love the law of God. Not because you're good, but because God is good. You need a good God to save you. You need a good God to change your heart, to change your lifestyle. Otherwise, you're going to live and sin the rest of your life. You must come before the throne of grace and plead with Him to forgive you of your sins. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Stop living that lifestyle of despair and sin. Stop living for that next high. It's futile. I've lived that lifestyle. You're just living for the next high. That's all you're living for. You don't even want anything but that weed or that ecstasy or whatever it is that gets you off. Whatever you're living for, man, it's not worth it. You're just waiting for the next high. Dying, perishing, you're perishing. All those who don't believe in Christ are perishing, but all those who have Jesus Christ have everlasting life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son so that whoever would believe in Him would not perish, but have eternal life. We're offering a free gift of grace through the Scriptures, through God. What He commissioned His church to do is to go out into all the world and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe all that He's commanded, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The Scriptures say that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Christ. All authority. The Greek is pasa exousia. What does pasa exousia mean? Well, it could mean all power or all authority, and both are true. So when we're talking about the Great Commission, we're talking about the all-powerful God who's going to win the world, and all nations shall flow up to the mountain of God and worship God and love Him, love His law, have the law written on the heart. The, the coastlands are waiting for the law of God. 
the nations are going to be one to King Jesus. Are you going to be on the side that's victorious or the side of defeat? Are you going to be on the losing side? Are you going to be on the side of your flesh and your sin? See, Jesus Christ, he came to destroy the works of the devil, and he did. He wrecked Satan on the cross. There was a prophecy, the Proto-Evangelion, the first proclamation of the gospel was in Genesis 3.15. And it says that, that the Messiah was going to come and he was going to crush the head of the serpent. And that's exactly what he did. He disarmed all rulers. He disar disarmed all principalities. He's defeated Satan. He's cast him out. He says, now the ruler of the world is cast out, and now I will draw all men to myself. Satan's gone. He is defeated. Now I'm going to win the world because of the cross. I'm going to win the world through my gospel. So are you going to take part of that victory? Or are you going to be on the, the side of defeat? You can't win against an eternal God, man. You can't. You can't win against the infinite God. It's impossible. He's going to live on and on forever and ever, from everlasting to everlasting. He is God, and you will perish in your sin. But we, out of love for neighbor and love for God, are telling you, repent or perish. We're telling you that there is a free gift of grace for the ungodly. Jesus Christ said, I came not to call sin uh, the righteous, but sinners to repentance. If you recognize you're a sinner, you recognize you're ungodly, you must come to him. You must repent. If you look at Romans 4, 5, it talks about this. It says if the one who does work, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. So you can stand before God as perfectly righteous, even though you're a sinner. See, God looked upon Jesus Christ as if he was a sinner, even though he wasn't. He gave Christ what you deserve. He gave Christ what I deserve. I deserve death. I should have been the one on that cross. But instead, Jesus Christ died on that cross so that I could have eternal life, everlasting life, life eternal as a free gift. Why would you toss up that free gift? You don't have to have your sins counted against you. It goes on, it says, just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. See, the Bible clearly says over and over again that we are counted righteous, not because of works, but because of the perfect atonement of Jesus Christ. We're saved by Christ's work, not ours. And then it says, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man who the Lord will not count his sin. And in the Greek it says, ume, which is a, it's a double negative. So it really is saying that there's a blessed man who the Lord never, never counts sin against him. Never, never. It's not even a possibility. It's not even possible for God to count your sin against you if you repent and come to Christ. See, if you repent and come to Christ, you will never perish. If you repent and come to Christ, you will never have to face the death penalty for your sins. You must be forgiven in Jesus. You must come to Jesus Christ. He is the only way. We plead with you. If you say you have no sin, you deceive yourselves and the truth is not in you. But if you would confess your sins, He is faithful and just to forgive you your sins and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. And that's what we want. We want you to be cleansed of your unrighteousness. We want you to be free from the bondage of your sin and become a slave of Jesus Christ. Be a slave of righteousness, not a slave to sin. You're going to be a slave of someone. Will it be your sin and your flesh? Or will it be Jesus Christ? And will you have eternal life and be on the side of victory? Come to Christ today. Thus says the Lord, turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. He is the only way. Come to him now. Yes.